anywhere from about 0.5 to 1 BCF per well or more. It's the production methods that are having an impact as well. You've got to learn these things. You've got to see that what you know in one shale may not transfer 100% to other shales, but it can help. Now, the technologies that work right now, of course, 3D seismic, innovative processing here that will allow you to see stress variations within the rock and along the wellbore. Horizontal wells usually tow up, which is a departure from what we're used to doing in other areas. But we have to keep these deliquefied to make them economic. And you need one sump on which to drain from. Another little production hint. Microseismic monitoring and the companies that come in and show you five or six points per stage, it's really not usable. You need 200 to 600 points per stage to really see what is happening and to drive that fracture from the frac van. And I've sat on a lot of fracks on frac vans to the point where management was saying, why aren't you back in the office? And it's like, I can do more good here because you're learning. You're learning as you go along. Okay, finally, water management is a huge section. Apache moved towards using salt water in the last two years doing a number of fracks, hundreds of fracks in Canada. We're doing the same thing. We're taking steps to now build our water plants to use recycled, which is my least favorite uh, fluid, produced water, which is my second least favorite, and my favorite is brine source wells, and there are some huge brine aquifers out there that will not be really usable for farming or anything else. We look at a couple of other things like the learning curve, and you see the uh, one in the upper left-hand corner, and these were Barnett, and you can see that the rates on these wells, the recovery on these wells was pretty slow until they got the horizontals and then multiple stage, and then you shot up here using simulfrax and other things which are site-specific for the Barnett Shale. But if you look at that lower right-hand corner, that's the learning curve for the Fayetteville, the Marcellus, and the Haynesville. Whereas the Barnett took about 27 years to get to max production from the wells, the other uh, wells have been doing this, the other areas have been doing this in three to five years using the information that we learned off of the Barnett. The next technologies, fracture conductivity, impro improving placement and longevity of the small fractures, uh, evolving gas production techniques, and finding alternative sources for frac water. Those are all technologies. The managing of the public perception is something we absolutely have to learn how to do. Most of the things here are problematic but solvable. And if you think we're the only ones that have problems, there's enough information coming out now on wind energy and solar energy to actually make you take a hard look at that and realize that there's only a certain amount of free energy you can take before you start disturbing the weather and patterns of the earth. This out of the Max Planck Institute in Germany, thermodynamic look at these things worldwide. Solar, thin film, if we went into full production with that and tried to make a dent in the actual needs of electricity, would exhaust the rare earth elements within two decades. The good part here is that even with all of the problems pointed out against natural gas, usually by lobbies, it's solvable. There's ways around meeting these challenges. And so what's behind the attack on shale gas? At $4 an MCF, there's not one other energy source that can be developed. Hence, you have a lot of money flowing in disguised as environmental studies to fight fracturing. And this is what you'll see after the, this is all over. The whole point here is that technology has taken us this far and it will project us into the future. But we have to learn it, 
we have to apply it and we have to talk about it and make people understand what we're talking about. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Pete Spark. I'll learn to talk one of these days. Dr. Pete Stark. Uh, Pete is the Vice President of Indu Industry Relations at IHS at CIRA uh, and uh, is a published numerous papers on the oil and gas industry, not only in the U.S., but around the world. I've gotten to know Pete over the last several years. Uh, we're frequently at, on panels together and at uh, conferences together, and he's uh, one of the more insightful guys in the business and uh, a delight as a person. He's got his Ph.D. in geology and uh, geophysics from University of Wisconsin, uh, which I guess here in Colorado we won't hold that against him. So anyway, um, uh, Pete Stark, please. Uh, are the slides up? There we go. Uh, no. Okay. Well, uh, delight to be here, uh, and and what a privilege to be a part of this panel. Mission Possible. What a terrific theme, and I'd like now to talk about. Uh, mission possible as it relates to the shale gale part two. This time it's about oil and I'd like to share with you uh, views of how uh, about the anatomy of the tight oil becoming a potential game changer. If we look at the market environment what we see is that uh, you know what has changed since July of 2009 just two years ago uh, I used to call the COGA conference, uh, you know, epicenter, well, it was COGA gas. But, uh, and two years ago, we had a recession, GDP was minus 2.6%. We are in a multi-speed global recovery, and unfortunately, the speed of the U.S. recovery is slow. Uh, our latest estimate from IHS Global Insight was about 2.4% for the year, and that may uh, be on the high side after this last quarter report. But we had Henry Hub prices of a 341, which were dramatically down and really hurting the tone of the industry and the messages here uh, in uh, 2009, uh, a little healthier. Uh, now at 443, uh, we had a WTI price of 61, and now we're uh, last month it averaged over uh, 94 uh, uh, dollars a barrel, uh, so much healthier. Uh, and the rig uh, count shows the dramatic change. We were at 245 oil rigs and 675 gas and 401 horizontals, or 43% of the rigs horizontal in, uh, two years ago. Now we're at over 1,000 oil rigs. Gas rigs have also, uh, you know, the activity has really recovered, uh, 880 rigs. But 50%, 7% of all of the drilling in the United States now is horizontal. So back in 2009, we had solidified the understanding of the shale gale for gas. Uh, seven BCF a day had been added since 2006, but uh, the success of the industry actually had led to shut-ins from low prices. Now we see the shale gale part two taking off, that, the oil component, the tide oil. We've added over, the U.S. added 230,000 barrels a day uh, since uh, May of 2009, and the drilling uh, for oil exceeded that of gas for the first time in 18 years. Now we're going to see some offset, unfortunately, because of the Gulf of Mexico moratorium. We think that the Gulf could actually drop as much as 260,000 barrels a day. So uh, the what's going on onshore is critical. This map shows all oil wells drilled since 1-1-2009, just through uh, uh, two weeks ago. And essentially, the turquoise color shows those uh, uh, wells that are horizontal. And the Bakken and the newly develop developing part of the Bakken uh, Exshaw play out in Glacier County, Montana, uh, kind of the poster child for the Shale uh, Gale Part Two. 
But as we look at developments, uh, over time what happened is that as the gas price dropped, oil price rose, what we saw is that companies began to move more towards from the dry gas into the liquids gas phases. And we had the movement in the Barnett uh, into the Barnett combo for oil. Uh, the Woodbine moved into clearly into the uh, liquids rich gas phase, which has been terrific, and then on into the oil window. And the granite wash, which was a long time, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, ma and pa, uh, vertical well, uh, gas play uh, as horizontal wells have been applied now have moved into uh, phases of the reservoir that actually generate 60 percent or more liquids. So that ha was a big jump into the uh, uh, shale gale part two. We've, we also saw movement of, of other shales, the Heath, the Niobrara, and the Rockies, also the Bone Spring in uh, uh, West Texas, Southeast New Mexico. And that's been followed up by a number of plays, uh, the Maori, the Cane Creek, and the Rockies. Uh, but, uh, and importantly, some interesting develop in the developments in the lower Tuscaloosa, a significant possibly new play in the Utica Shale in Ohio, the Collingwood in Michigan, and uh, who knows what the potential really might be for the Monterey in California. And there's another mixture of reservoirs coming on in tight oil, and George certainly uh, visited upon this, where we have uh, the, uh, it's tight oil in thinner sandstones, the woodbine, for instance, uh, is one in East Texas that has some fascinating results. Uh, we're seeing the Cleveland sand in Oklahoma. We're seeing also the Mississippi and carbonate in the northwest shelf of Oklahoma. The point is we have a, a great complexity of reservoirs. As one uh, geologist in the Permian Basin said, you know, we're looking at every single rock now in which we can drill a horizontal well. So this is really expanding rapidly. If we look at some of the reservoir uh, uh, IP results, initial potential tests, what we see is the Bakken and Three Forks are right at the top. And the oil and gas component is important to realize here. A at issue is that a lot of these reservoirs, and particularly those that migrated from gas into uh, liquids rich parts of gas and then the oil window have a lot of gas component. We feel that uh, the associated gas part of these oil developments may be generating more new gas production than gas wells themselves and we're looking at two to five BCF a day of added gas production coming just from the associated gas going forward. And you see some other of these sands in, in this list, the Delaware sand, the Brushy Canyon, as well as the Woodford that have, uh, or Woodbine, excuse me, that have yielded good results. Let's take a look at a couple of the plays just to get a uh, feel of their anatomy. Uh, this uh, map shows the uh, uh, Williston Basin, the Bakken, and the gold or yellow uh, dots are, represent those wells that have over a thousand barrels a day of initial potential. Up until about a year or so ago, we thought the p partial Sanish area to the east and also the Elm Coulee to the west were the, the two sweet spots. But if you look at those thousand barrel a day completions, they're much more widespread now. Uh, it's a package of rocks, the source rocks together with porous and permeable reservoirs that are critical. And if we look at the statistics uh, on the chart, what we see is an average oil IP of about 1,000 barrels a day. Interestingly, in, since 1-1 of 2009, the Bakken from an initial potential test has generated about uh, a million barrels a day of IP. Now that's not production rate. That is a higher IP in cumulative than the 17,800 vertical oil wells drilled and completed in this same window of time. So it, that shows the magnitude of this change. If we look at some of the key operators and their uh, 
it, it's, this is the six key operators in the Bakken. It shows their first 30-day average production. The blue line looks really subtle there, but it goes from 9,000 barrels uh, in a month uh, up to 16,000, and that's a 78% increase, and that represents the technology increases that uh, George was talking about. And the red line represents uh, an even uh, much greater in increase, and those are among Brigham's wells. If we look at the production going forward, we we see the potential of 800,000 to a million barrels a day, and obviously as the technology and process improvements increase, this number will keep increasing going forward. The Bakken has helped increase Rocky Mountain oil production by grow by six, over 66 million barrels a year uh, since uh, 1993. If we look at the uh, Niobrara, this map shows all of the oil shows uh, uh, that were recorded historically, and we see then three major areas, the DJ Basin, the North Park, uh, parts of the uh, Powder River Basin where we've seen production. Uh, of course, we had the silo field uh, that kind of led the early surge of horizontal drilling back in the 80s, and then the EOG well, Noble Energy, uh, underneath the gas field. And if you look at statistics, we see uh, a lot of wells permitted, over 1,000 wells permitted. We see evidence of only 165 sputted, and production data so far have only been released on 53 wells. So we see an initial potential of about 341 barrels a day. And it's about understanding the geology and the kinetics. Uh, this slide, uh, courtesy of Bob Kosky, uh, was modified from a Tuzek back in 1973, but it shows the gas and oil generation windows. It shows uh, where we, th based on the uh, geological, geochemical, and uh, pressure data where the oil window is, cross-section shows this more effectively. And the point is about 10 to 20 million barrels of oil per square mile could have been generated. If we look at uh, a uh, set of decline plots from Noble, what we see is only 40 barrels a day, or excuse me, 40,000 barrels recovery at the bottom from vertical wells. Average of 11 horizontal wells was 290,000, and then the best, the Gemini well, at 500,000 barrels. Moving on then to the uh, Eagle Ford, we see the, the red wells and, and the turquoise being the horizontal, showing the mostly the gas, uh, the liquids rich part of the Eagle Ford, and, and then the oil window in green. Uh, some uh, averages there of about 514 barrels of oil a day. If you use add the gas component, it's over 600 barrels of oil equivalent. Uh, if we look at potential in the wet gas window, we see over 42 TCF, about 35% liquids, and projecting over 7 BCF a day by 2020. Uh, the oil window, uh, more difficult to get a handle on because we don't know how many, what the template will be per square mile, but it may take 33,000 oil wells to reach uh, that uh, potential objective of over, uh, 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 excuse me, nine, excuse me, the potential of getting to nine billion barrels of oil recovery. There are some challenges, and let me walk through these fairly rapidly. In the Eagle Ford, one is how to handle the natural gas liquids. We're looking at five mil million, uh, excuse me, BCF a day of methane, but another two BCF a day of ethane and uh, uh, other uh, non-ethane NGLs, and the difficulty of handling, transporting, and marketing that is a challenge. If we look also at an issue that also was addressed uh, by uh, my colleagues on this panel, and that is the increase of investment in the United States by uh, some international companies, and there are a number uh, that have invested in the Eagle Ford, Reliance, uh, Statoil, 
China National Offshore Oil Company, Korea, et cetera. And essentially, they are competing for these resources, and we're seeing very high prices, the uh, average of over 21,000 an acre being paid by Marathon for Hillcorp. Another slide from Bob Kosky, which is an interesting dynamic, and that's the issue of access to uh, potential prospective lands. And this applies in the, this is five states in the Rockies, and we see that from the period of 2004 through 2008, over 1,500, in fact, it's closer to 2,000 parcels a year were leased. But beginning in 2009, a precipitous drop, and that uh, comes in part courtesy of the new administration, which I don't think has quite adopted our governor's uh, attitude of fairness and balance in the administration of uh, access to, to uh, lands. Another issue that has been brought up by uh, journalists is concern about uh, costs. Is the industry a scam? And indeed, in the 2006-8 time frame, we had some uh, challenging economics as the price of gas was dropping. We drilled a lot. Uh, there were a lot of wells drilled to hold acreage, et cetera. But our data show that the the, uh, as you see the costs going up there in the green, what has happened in the last two years is that the EURs per well uh, for operators in the tight gas and oil have also improved, and so the economics are back on target. Well, this uh, topic was also looked at, and that is what we've called the fear of fracking, and it's been uh, uh, epitomized by Gasland, the New York Times series, the Cornell study of greenhouse gas emissions, and many others. And the point is, the, the, the message that I see Colorado Oil and Gas Association and Tisha championing is that of, uh, and George also hit on this, communicate effectively, because I got, we were personally involved at IHS in the article on, from Cornell, which used data, and it was really fascinating. They assumed that the initial potential test volumes of gas wells in the Haynesville, 100% of the production for a 15-day period, 24 million cubic feet a day, was vented to the atmosphere is the basis of their paper that got worldwide recognition because they said, well, shale gas has as much greenhouse gas emission as worldwide coal. But it's that kind of misuse of information and uh, uh, that really is hurting the industry. Another brief challenge is the bottleneck at uh, Cushing. Uh, there's an excess amount of crude going in there right now. Uh, it's coming in from Canada, and of course, we thought, you know, this is a part of the same sort of dynamic that hurt LNG coming, uh, investors. But the, the certainty of tight oil or heavy oil coming in from Canada from the oil sands led to a lot of refinery modifications, pipelines, et cetera. But relief valves are in sight, but nevertheless, uh, we see that uh, over the next, uh, probably adjusting down more closely to a 10 to $12 a barrel WTI discount will persist through 2013, and, uh, but it will get worked out. Uh, if we look finally at where are we headed, now this is just a scenario. It's six of the reservoirs that we had uh, 20 or, um, on, outlined on the map that are tight sand producers or candidates. And what we see is a projection in this scenario on a what if, and the Barnett and the Eagle Ford are the most certain, and they are the largest chunk in the blue and green in the middle, but reaching over 3 million barrels a day by 2020. What does this possibly mean? Well, the size of the prize that is on the map that we've identified is around 50 billion barrels of oil equivalent now. And that's essentially double what was being carried as U.S. oil reserves uh, into, the, uh, into the start of this decade. We're looking at 3 million barrels of oil a day by 2020. We've seen that the 
oil rigs have exceeded gas rigs. We've seen U.S. oil production re reversing for the first time in 24 years. But it means much more. The rhetoric over the last week on the, uh, uh, the budget and the, uh, not the, the budget, excuse me, on, on looking at the deficit and raising the uh, ceiling, debt ceiling, has talked about trillions of dollars over a decade. Well, it's interesting that if this three million barrels a day of oil would materialize, and it could be more, this is just a model on six formations, 1.3 million jobs, a little short of $1 trillion of GDP over this 10-year time period, and at the end of the period, it would be over $200 billion a year to GDP, a same offset to the balance of payments, and it also would contribute almost $100 billion in taxes and royalties to governments. So what we have here in this room and the expertise represented by this industry is certainly on the threshold of a game changer in oil that this country needs to recognize the huge potential value to the economy, to the well-being of uh, the country. And uh, I applaud all of you who are involved in this because it's really a fascinating and important change. Uh, it's been a pleasure to share these views with you and to be a part of this panel. So now we get to the part where we take questions and hopefully start a little bit of an exchange of ideas. Uh, um, I guess the microphones are here and here in each of the aisles. Uh, anybody have any questions? Well, okay, since you don't, I will. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, the first question is, we, we talked a lot about uh, technology uh, adaption and and George talked, and, and Pete talked a little bit about the way that you can see the impact of technology by looking at initial production rates of producers or by basins, depending upon how you want to look at it. One of the things that we've looked at at Bentec that is interesting to me is the disparity between basins. I mean, you see a, a decline rate of 30 or 40 percent in one basin. The next basin, that's a shale play as well, the decline might be 15, 20 percent. Uh, and then the difference is uh, also, you know, you can take company X, you can see their performance in, uh, say, the Eagleford looks, uh, shows very remarkable uh, improvement in IPs. You go to the Barnett or you go to the Bakken and they're not so good. Well, I was curious as to the panelists' thoughts about what are some of the factors that really influence the way an individual company uh, performance on some of these issues. Um, of all. George, you want to take a shot at that first? I think part of this is the ability and um, the willingness of the operating company to actually accept risk of learning. And we accept risk with drilling, we accept risk with virtually everything we do, but we have to figure out how are you going to learn how to apply this because what we've seen and there is a drillinginfo.com study out on the Barnett that graded the production area and then in equal production areas actually looked at the performance of operators in developing the resources in that particular area. And so it was a pretty well an apples to apples comparison and it was remarkable that the difference between the best operators and what they could do on both IP and EUR was something like 50 to 70 percent higher than the average and significantly better than those companies that were down on the bottom. And it would surprise you sometimes to see that because some small companies that were really willing to take a risk, willing to learn and optimize as they went along, were actually some of the better operators. Pete, do you have any comments? Yeah, uh, uh, I'll look back at a study we did on uh, the uh, uh, unconventional gas last year, and there were a couple of observations. We also looked at the uh, performance behavior of the five to ten leading operators in the place, 
Uh, one observation, we really felt that in a lot of the gas plays, there tended to be a performance bias on just being in the right part of the reservoir, obviously, the right geological conditions. But throughout all of the reservoir compartments that we looked at, the same observation of uh, a great disparity in the uh, individual operator performance compared to operator, and also over time. And it was fascinating to see where some operators who did the learning experience improved, steadily improved over a four or uh, six year period of time, their average well performance, while others actually diminished. And, and part of that we tied to how they were varying their fracks, how it also related to ex, uh, which companies became more cost conscious versus rather, I guess, innovative conscious, and uh, also on operating procedures. Those companies that really tightened the belt on using the right technologies and operating practices across the board. Mike. I was going to say, Porter, what I might add is that, uh, you know, from being an operator standpoint, you also have to look at it from the standpoint of time. And, and uh, you know, going back to what the gentleman said, I know that uh, from personal experience. Can you guys hear Mike from well field, field operations um, that over, let's say, a four, five, six year period in trying different things, trying to be innovative, and we were using high strength gels, uh, high strength profits, or I should say, you know, very complicated gels, high strength profits, and actually went into by running micro seismic, just as an example, was able to go ahead and reduce the job size because we saw we weren't treating, or we were actually treating more of the rock than just the reservoir. So we were able to cut the cost, go to slick water, go to simple sand, reduce the cost by 67%, and went ahead and increased productivity by about 14%. And but that's something that happened over, over time, and just trying to experiment and looking at the different things that other operators were trying as well. Jim, you want me to comment? I'd be interested in knowing, in your case in particular, since you got some activity over in Europe, is are some of these uh, same dynamics that work over there? And we are seeing a lot of the same same issues, and, and one of the points that I was going to make was it, in the different areas, especially like the Marcellus and the Eagleford, and even in Haynesville uh, and Fayetteville, there has been a lot of catch up. There has been a time element, uh, and, and yes, the willingness to learn, but in the different character of the shales that have, that have, uh, you're running into uh, in terms of how deep the well goes, how, how uh, even, even the technology in the last five years has changed so dramatically. We're seeing the same type of issue in uh, Europe that we're seeing in, in Marcellus in, in defining the character and dealing with drilling in mountainous terrain, uh, which you s you've already uh, solved, in well, solved in Colorado. But it, more than anything else, what I'm seeing in the producer side is that they've been playing a lot of catch up, uh, especially the small to medium sized producers, because they've had a credit issue. Uh, after 2008, there was a lot where, where some of my companies were drilling 10 wells a quarter, they're down to one well a quarter. Well, that, that lim severely limits them, especially for something like the Eagleford, where we're just now getting a very clearer picture of how Eagleford is, is laid out. And like we said earlier, that uh, some of the wells are not playing out or producing as just because of the geology and the geography of, of that well. So there is a, we've compressed a lot of the learning curve into a short period of time reali when we realize that we haven't been doing this very long. Would you uh, announce your name and yeah, affiliation and before the question? Yes, Terry Dobkins, Petro Harvester. Question for George. Uh, George, one of the things you had on your slide there had to do with using food grade additives in the frac fluids, and all of us are dealing with the issue of the public perception of fracs. How's the availability, cost, and effectiveness of switching over to green chemicals in the frac business, and can it be applied to the frac business outside of uh, the shales? We've been using green chemicals for the last five or six years uh, in uh, the slick water fracs, but I don't think there's a public perception that that's happened. So I'm just wondering how the effectiveness and costs and availability